Hello Blazers, welcome to episode 53 of UAB Green and Told, original air date Monday, August 30th, 2021. Through this podcast, we are able to share stories from members of the UAB community. You can listen into all past episodes on Spotify and the Apple Podcast app. While you're there, I'd love for you to leave a written review so we can reach more alumni. I'm Greg Berry, a UAB alum and assistant director in the Office of Alumni Affairs. Today, we're catching up with Asha Adams. While she has made a mission of helping small business owners and nonprofit leaders connect, at one point she had hoped to be a poet like Maya Angelou, Mary Oliver, or Audre Lorde. I had been performing poetry like throughout the city. I would go to different places around Birmingham to perform poetry. So I was like, oh, let me, you know, try my hand at creative writing. Asha is still a writer, but today, as she'll explain, she writes with a purpose in order to be impactful in her community. It's important for us to understand where we've been, to understand where we're going, and also to track the progress and understand the work. And it's those beginnings that have led Asha to where she is today. Um, I started doing that work by being a change agent in organizations, freelancing in organizations, just doing whatever I could to help. So now I go in and audit and I do policy change. Despite growing up in Birmingham, UAB wasn't Asha Adams' first choice. No, she wanted to go off on her own. But in the end, she found herself missing the city she grew up in, one she is passionate about because of its history. It's the heart of the civil rights movement. It's the heart of sort of the awakening that we're at today as it relates to being inclusive and being caring and considerate and understanding that Black Lives Matter. I feel like it's the heart of that. Um, That's what makes Birmingham special to me. How much was talked about, you know, the history of Birmingham in your household when you were growing up as a young Black female in the heart of Birmingham? So I literally passed by Angela Davis's house that she grew up in every day on the way to school. So I have, you know, it was not just a part of the conversation. It was a part of Uh, my upbringing in a deep way. My mom went to Tuggle Elementary where her mom taught. She was my, her mom was my mother's elementary school teacher. We grew up with that pride and that sense of belonging um, in Birmingham. So for me, it was a pretty normal life, but the history was definitely a part of how I was raised. You mentioned some of the teachers that you had that were part of the movement way back when. Who were some of the key role models that you kind of gravitated towards to kind of set yourself up for your future? So Reverend Woods, who was a part of the ACLC, was my advisor in high school, and he spent a lot of time at Parker High School. So um, we learned a lot from him. And um, whenever I would like sneak off campus to the candy guy's house, You'd have to like sing in his office. You have to, (laughs) you have to go in his office and sing and hear about his days in the movement. So um, I had some time in his office to learn those things. And um, Dr. Weems, um, who was a part of the Black Panther Party, she instilled a lot of pride in who we were and gave us great stories about history and, and things that happened. It was like the newer teachers that weren't necessarily like a part of the movement, but just sharing the story. Like Dr. Askari Hadari was a young professor at UAB when I took my African-American studies course, who really brought the movement to life and made us go into the community and volunteer at places like the Malcolm X Grassroots Movement for Self-Determination Center. That really impacted me. So in my time at UAB, it was like the younger people who inspired me. What was Aisha like when she was a little girl? Um, She was creative. I know the juices were flowing. So what were you like when you were young? I think just like inquisitive and intentional. I spent a lot of time like dancing in my grandmother's screen door because it, you know, served as a reflection, (laughs) (laughs) like a mirror. So I, I spent a lot of time doing that. I was an avid reader. I started like a library. I would sell my new kids on the block books for my new edition <laughs> paraphernalia. Like I'd rent it out to other kids. So I've always been into business and like making money and enterprising and into books. 
um, I love to read and, and share knowledge. So You wound up getting bit by the creative writing bug at an earlier age. What was it about writing that just was such a great thing, a great outlet for you to grasp onto? The first poem I wrote, my dad, I was worried that my dad would be drafted to the Gulf War. Mm-hmm. Um, so my mom was like, maybe you should just write something. And I did. And everybody was like, it's so good. And I didn't believe them. Um, by the time I got to college, I didn't know what I was interested in, but I had been performing poetry, like throughout the city, I would go to different places around Birmingham to perform poetry. So I was like, oh, let me, you know, try my hand at creative writing. And so that really, um, gave me the opportunity to express myself. And it wasn't until my last semester, Dr. Tentaculus, and she was like this powerhouse and she taught me to write creative nonfiction. And that's when I, you know, really felt like I was in position and had an understanding of why writing was so important to me because I could tell the truth in my writing and also right to change things. And so that was just like a beautiful place for me. So I started out with a love for poetry. And by the time I graduated, I just knew like creative nonfiction was my home. When people think about creative writing, most of the time, they're probably thinking fiction, because this is stuff that's made up. How do you make reality creative? I'm sure you've heard the truth is always stranger than fiction, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so that's one way. And another way is there's a lot of tension in the truth, right? Um, in my piece, uh, Blurred Lines Birmingham, I literally talk about um, the division uh, that the Appalachian Mountain actually serves to separate people by class, by social economic status, right? So if you live over the mountain, and I'm sure you've heard that expression before, mm -hmm. if you live on the other side of the mountain, well, when I moved to Asheville, everybody had a relationship with the Appalachian Mountains. And I was like, well, let me find out what my relationship is. And that's when I learned what over the mountain actually meant. I think that the truth is what is important. And um, there are so many stories that haven't been told. For me, the creative nonfiction is easy to write because just the fact that it is real. When you set off to college, you really didn't know what you wanted to be when you grew up. With that in mind, why UAB? Why did you make the decision to stay in your backyard? So the truth is, I did not choose UAB. I chose other places. So the first place I tried was, of course, an HBCU. I went to Alabama A&M, and it was great. I had a lot of fun. My friends were there. But it was like I needed to be home. I needed to be centered. So I tried to move closer to home. And I went to the University of Montevallo. And, you know, the University of Montevallo is a great school. I got a lot of good sleep there. Um, and I learned a lot. Um, but I still needed to be closer to home. And I really think it was because UAB was situated in the city, right? So I could, you know, stay at my mama's house. I didn't stay on campus. And then I got my own house. And I was right, you know, near my mom, near my dad, near my aunts and uncles and cousins and my brother and my sister. And I got an opportunity to build a life where I was and college was a part of that life, right? It was the main focus, but it was a, a part of my normal life as when I was going off to school, it felt like I was leaving my life behind. Um, so there's a lot of power and value in how UAB is situated downtown in Birmingham, amongst the rest of the world, right? As opposed to the other colleges that I talked about, which were like, sort of like islands, right? At what point did what you wanted to do once you graduated become a little more clear through your UAB experience? So it didn't. Um, I remember when I was graduating, the poet, the Afro-Latin poet, Nikki Finney came to speak for the Creative Writing Club. And I said, I'm going to go and be a teacher. And I said, because I have a son and I want to make sure that, you know, we have a good life. So I'm just going to go be a teacher. I'm going to give up on my writing goals and my writing dreams. And she said, Aisha, a writer's right. Whether you're writing like a mortgage for a person in the community. And I was like, what is she talking about? Like, why would I write to help somebody write their mortgage papers? Right. 
Well, fast forward 20 years later, when the PPP loans came out, people from my community were like, Aisha, how do I get this? Right. You know, I have my small business, but I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know how to do it. You know, what do I do? And so the lending officer hired me as a community liaison to work with people to help them apply for their PPPs. Right. So at the time, I don't think it was clear to me, but it's always been like this flashlight. You know, if I'm working with a family whose child has been suspended and I'm helping to write that suspension defense letter, or if I am working, you know, I just got off the phone with a leader today and I asked about their um, handbook and she's like, we don't have a handbook. And it's like, oh no, we got to get you a handbook, right? Um, So just being able to show up in my writing um, was a concept that was planted to me was that was planted in my head at UAB and nurtured from my professors. But I, I actually think just in this conversation, I'm appreciating their wisdom and, and, and understanding exactly where those kind of comments were coming from. So what point in your life did you wind up in North Carolina? Because here's a Birmingham girl, you bounced around a couple different colleges, wind up at UAB, and now you're in Asheville. I ended up um, filling out the application to go to Hurston Wright, right when I graduated. And so I I did that work um, and I started teaching school. And so things happened in my life. I ended back up in Birmingham and was looking for work. And the Asheville City School System here recruited me here um, to to work with their students. And so that's kind of how I got here. So what were you doing with the students in Asheville once you got recruited to go up there? Yeah, I was an English teacher and my specialty was just working with struggling readers. That had to have been a little bit outside the comfort zone because by nature, by background, you're a creative writer. Well, you know, like, again, all this community work, I would leave the campus and walk over to Glen Iris and and be in Ms. Madden's classroom as a part of my work study when I was at UAB. So I had a work study that was in the school system and I worked with students and helped them prepare for their end of year tests. What kind of comparisons can you draw between Asheville and your hometown of Birmingham? They're like two, like night and day. Okay. Night and day. So, you know, Birmingham is a predominantly black city. I mean, there's lots of black people in power and, um, since I've been here in Asheville, this is the first time they've had more than, you know, one black city council person. Okay. Um, they had their first black mayor um, since I've been here. Um, so it's just different because again, like Birmingham is the heart of the civil rights movement. You have continued to grow as an individual from the time you started writing poems as a a young kid through college and to where you are today. Why do you keep that narrative going? Why is it important? It's important for us to understand where we've been, to understand where we're going, and also to track the progress and understand the work. So in my day-to-day work, I cultivate spaces of diversity, equity, and inclusion in May profit organizations. So that's what I do now. And so those stories help me understand um, policy procedures and practices that I need to change. And that led to, I'm sure in 2014, you founding your own company. Was that stemmed based off of that desire with all the diversity and inclusion? Yeah. And um, I wanted to so, so, so many people for me in my time in Birmingham, I lived a, until I got to UAB, a pretty black experience, right? I went to a black high school. I lived in a black neighborhood. And like, if you're from Asheville, you don't have the luxury of that, right? It's just because of population size. Um, It wasn't until I got to UAB that I was, you know, having the opportunity to understand like, oh, the world is bigger than my neighborhood. You know what I mean? Like, oh, like it became clear to me, like, oh, if I can change policies, practices and procedures, it'll be great. And so um, I started doing that work by being a change agent in organizations, freelancing in organizations, just doing whatever I could to help. So now I go in and audit and I do policy change 
um, and I help with that work. So what are some simple things people can do to help make change, help lead this nation to a change? The first thing that people have to do is get educated, right? Because we have to understand the stories and we have to understand them in context. Um, a really great story that I'd like to share with you is we all know Rosa Parks. Do you know Rosa Parks? Yeah, right? you bet. She refused to give up her seat on the yep. bus in Montgomery, right? Well, we often think that Rosa Parks created that change, right? Now people can sit wherever they choose to on the bus, right? Yep. Right. But she wasn't the policy changer. It was actually a young woman named Claudette Calvin, who was in New York, who sued the New York Transit and set a precedence for Black people not to have to sit in the back of the bus. Rosa Parks kind of just rose it to consciousness and let people like you and me and other bystanders, people who were listening to the radio or maybe watching the television, that's how they found out, like, this is a bad policy and it's something that we can change and we need to be against it, right? But that policy happened, policy change didn't happen until they were sued, they had to pay money, and it was in a courtroom, right? That was the true policy change. I, when I went to UAB and I went to, I was spending time at the Civil Rights Institute, I thought it was Rosa Parks too. It wasn't until I began to study the movement more deeply, I began to understand that Rosa Parks is the consciousness of the movement. She's the activist, was having the problem, but it was Claudette Calvin who was the advocate, the person that was willing to go into that system and change it. Right. And so actually that whole process is the thought leadership that my work is built on. I work with the university, um, with Lenore Ryan University. Um, I founded their Equity and Diversity Institute. And um, it kind of stemmed from my work learning about Rosa Parks. Diversity and equity, those are big words, especially now. Where is this nation going when it comes to those two words? I mean, I think it's like anything, it's a continuum. So some people are moving forward. Some people are standing still. Some people are moving back. Um, I think there is a lot of work to be done. And that's good for me because I feel like I'll be in business um, for a while. Um, but people are are trying. And, and, and the voices, I, whether it's just more social media, whether it's because we're more plugged in, um, whether it's because people are having a change of heart or whether, you know, we're just being louder than the others. Like there's some change happening, some movement happening. And while there's so much more to happen, I'm sort of grateful for what's happening. I want to keep it moving. And so the way that I do that is create spaces for all people, um, no matter their race, um, ethnicity, uh, gender, social economic background, that I want to create places where people can thrive um, no matter who they are. Your creative writing started as a youngster, writing about your father, or at least in his honor, as he may be called up um, into war. How much poetry do you do now? I don't write a lot of poetry, but I do still write a lot of creative nonfiction. What would your eight year old self think of you now? You know, I think she'd be like, you did good. I wish you would run more or walk more, but you did good. <laughs> That's Asha Adams. Asha graduated UAB in 2006, earning a Bachelor of Arts degree in English from the UAB College of Arts and Sciences. Today, she's a small business owner, LREDI program developer at Lenore Ryan University in Asheville, North Carolina, an executive producer of The Asheville View. While she's moved away from Birmingham, Asha Adams has a good idea of what it means to be a blazer. I'm so proud to be a blazer. I think for me, it's about blazing the trail, keeping the conversation going, and, and being a part of community. The biggest part for me about my days at UAB was the effort that um, particularly the creative writing department made to connect to community and help me see the value in my own community and to help me see like the brilliance in it and to be able to look at my community as source material um, and the worthiness of my own community. Be sure to listen into previous episodes of UAB Green and Told. You can find all of them at alumni.uab.edu slash green and told. Have a story to share? 
email greenandtold at uab.edu. Finally, be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Just search for UAB Alumni. Thanks for listening, and until next time, Go Blazers! <laughs>